Chapter thirty six of the Hand of Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter thirty six The Dungeon. We were out in the corridor now, Smith showing the way with the light of his electric pocket lamp. My mind was clear enough, but I felt as weak as a child. You look positively ghastly, old man, rapped Smith, which is no matter for wonder. I have yet to learn how it happened that you are not lying insensible, or dead as a result of the drugged wine. When I heard someone moving in your room, it never occurred to me that it was you. Smith, I said, the house seems as still as death. You, Karamina, and myself are the only occupants of the East Wing. Omapulo saw to that. Then he... He is a member of the Sea Fan, a creature of Dr. Fu Manchu. Yes, beyond all doubt. Sir Lionel is unfortunate, as ever, in his choice of servants. I blame my own stupidity entirely, Petrie, and I pray that my enlightenment has not come too late. What does it all mean? What have you learnt? Mind these three steps, warned Smith, glancing back. I found my mind persistently dwelling upon the matter of that weird rapping, Petrie, and I recollected the situation of Sir Lionel's room on the southeast front. A brief inspection revealed the fact that, by means of a kindly branch of ivy, I could reach the roof of the east tower from my window. Well, one may walk from there along the roof of the southeast front, and by lying face downwards at the point where it projects above the main entrance, look into Sir Lionel's room. I saw you go. I feared that someone was watching me, but that it was you I never supposed. Neither Barton nor his man are in that room, Petrie. They have been spirited away. This is Karamina's door. He grasped me by the arm, at the same time directing the light upon a closed door before which we stood. I raised my fist and beat upon the panels. Then, every muscle tensed and my heart throbbing wildly, I listened for the girl's voice. Not a sound broke that deathly silence except the beating of my own heart, which I thought must surely be audible to my companion. Frantically I hurled myself against the stubborn oak, but Smith thrust me back. "'Useless, Petrie,' he said. "'Useless. This room is in the base of the East Tower. Yours is above it, and mine at the top. The corridors approaching the three floors deceive one, but the fact remains. I have no positive evidence, but I would wager all I possess that there is a stair in the thickness of the wall, and hidden doors in the panelling of the three apartments. The yellow group has somehow obtained possession of a plan of the historic secret passages and chambers of Greywater Park. Homopulu is the spy in the household.' and Sir Lionel, with his man Kennedy, was removed directly the invitation to us had been posted. The group will know by now that we have escaped them, but Karamina— "'Smith!' I groaned. "'Smith, what can we do? What has befallen her?' "'This way,' he snapped. "'We are not beaten yet. We must arouse the servants. Why, it would be a sheer waste of precious time. There are only three men who actually sleep in the house, excepting Homopulu, and these are in the northwest wing.' "'No, Petrie, we must rely upon ourselves.' He was racing recklessly along the tortuous corridors and up the oddly placed stairways of that old-world building. My anguish had reinforced the atropine which I had employed as an antidote to the opiate in the wine, and now my blood, that had coursed sluggishly, leapt through my veins like fire, and I burned with a passionate anger. Into a large and untidy bedroom we burst. Books and papers littered about the floor— curios ranging from mummied cats and ibises to turkish yetagans and zulu assegais surrounded the place in riotous disorder beyond doubt this was the apartment of sir lionel barton a lamp burned upon a table near to the disordered bed and a discoloured greek statuette of orpheus lay overturned on the carpet close beside it humapulu was on the point of leaving this room at the moment that i peered in at the window said smith breathing heavily from here there is another entrance to the secret passages. Have your pistol ready. He stepped across the disordered room to a little alcove near the foot of the bed, directing the ray of the pocket lamp upon the small square panelling. Ah, he cried, a note of triumph in his voice, he has left the door ajar. A visit of inspection was not anticipated to-night, Petrie. Thank God for an Indian liver and a suspicious mind. He disappeared into a yawning cavity which now I perceive to exist in the wall. I hurried after him, and found myself upon roughly fashioned stone steps in a very low and narrow descending passage. Over his shoulder, note the direction, said Smith breathlessly. 
we shall presently find ourselves at the base of the east tower down we went and down the ray of the electric lamp always showing more steps ahead until at last these terminated in a level arched passage curving sharply to the right two paces more brought us to a doorway less than four feet high approached by two wide steps a blackened door having a most cumbersome and complicated lock showed in the recess nayland smith bent and examined the mechanism intently freshly oiled he commented you know into whose room it opens well enough i knew and detecting that faint haunting perfume which spoke of the dainty personality of karamina my anger blazed up anew came a faint sound of metal grating upon metal and smith pulled open the door which turned outward upon the steps and bent further forward sweeping the ray of light about the room beyond empty of course he muttered now for the base of these damned nocturnal operations he descended the steps and began to flash the light all about the arched passageway wherein we stood the present dining-room of greywater park lies almost due south of this spot he mused suppose we try back we retraced our steps to the foot of the stair and the wall on their left was an opening low down against the floor and little more than three feet high it reminded me of some of the entrances to those seemingly interminable passages whereby one approaches the sepulchral chambers of the egyptian pyramids now for it snapped smith follow me closely down he dropped and having the lamp thrust out before him began to crawl into the tunnel as his heels disappeared and only a faint light outlined the opening i dropped upon all fours in turn and began laboriously to drag myself along behind him the atmosphere was damp chilly and evil smelling therefore at the end of some ten or twelve yards of this serpentine crawling when i saw smith ahead of me to be standing erect i uttered a stifled exclamation of relief the thought of karamaneh having been dragged through this noisome hole was one i dared not dwell upon a long narrow passage now opened up its end invisible from where we stood smith hurried forward for the first thirty or forty paces the roof was formed of massive stone slabs then its character changed the passage became lower and one was compelled frequently to lower the head in order to avoid the oaken beams which crossed it we are passing under the dining-room said smith it was from here the sound of beating first came what do you mean i have built up a theory which remains to be proved petrie in my opinion a captive of the yellow group escaped to-night and sought to summon assistance but was discovered and overpowered sir lionel sir lionel or kennedy yes i believe so enlightenment came to me i understood the pitiable condition into which the greek butler had been thrown by the phenomenon of the ghostly knocking but smith hurried on and suddenly i saw that the passage had entered upon a sharp declivity and now both roof and walls were composed of crumbling brickwork smith pulled up and thrust back a hand to detain me shh he hissed and grasped my arm silent intently still we stood and listened the sound of a guttural voice was clearly distinguishable from somewhere close at hand smith extinguished the lamp a faint luminance proclaimed itself directly ahead still grasping my arm smith began slowly to advance toward the light one two three four five paces we crept onward and i found myself looking through an archway into a medieval torture chamber only a part of the place was visible to me but its character was unmistakable leg irons boots and thumb screws hung in racks upon the fungi covered wall a massive iron studded door was open at the further end of the chamber and on the threshold stood homopulo holding a lantern in his hand even as i saw him he stepped through followed by one of those short thick-set burmans of whom dr fu manchu had a number among his entourage they were members of the villainous robber bands notorious in india as the dacwits over one broad shoulder slung sackwise the dacwit carried a girl clad in scanty white drapery madness seized me the madness of sorrow and impotent wrath for with karamina being borne off before my eyes i dared not fire at her abductors lest i should strike her nayland smith uttered a loud cry and together we hurled ourselves into the chamber heedless of what of whom else it might shelter we sprang for the group in the distant doorway a memory is mine of the dark white face of homopulu peering wild-eyed over the lantern 
of the slim white-clad form of the lovely captive seeming to fade into the obscurity of the passage beyond then with bleeding knuckles with wild imprecations bubbling from my lips i was battering upon the mighty door which had been slammed in my face at the very instant that i had gained it brace up man brace up cried smith and in his strenuous grimly purposeful fashion he shouldered me away from the door a battering ram could not force that timber we must seek another way i staggered weakly back into the room hand raised to my head i looked about me a lantern stood in a niche in one wall weirdly illuminating that place of ghastly memories there were braziers branding irons with other instruments dear to the black ages about me and gagged chained side by side against the opposite wall lay sir lionel barton and another man unknown to me already nayland smith was bending over the intrepid explorer whose fierce blue eyes glared out from the sun-tanned face madly whose grey hair and moustache liberally bristled with rage long repressed i choked down the emotions that boiled and seized within me and sought to release the second captive a stockily built clean-shaven man first i removed the length of toweling which was tied firmly over his mouth and thank you sir he said composedly the keys of these irons are on the ledge there beside the lantern i broke the first ring i was chained to but the yellow devils overhauled me all manacled as i was halfway along the passage before i could attract your attention and fixed me up to another and stronger ring ere he had finished speaking the keys were in my hands and i had unlocked the guys from both the captives sir lionel barton his gag removed unloosed a torrent of pent-up wrath the hell fiends drugged me he shouted that black villain homer pulo doctored my tea i woke in this damnable cell the secret of which has been lost for generations he turned blazing blue eyes upon kennedy how did you come to be trapped he demanded unreasonably i credited you with a modicum of brains homer pulo came running from your room sir and told me you were taken suddenly ill and that a doctor must be summoned without delay well well you fool dr hamilton was away sir a false call beyond doubt snapped smith therefore i went for the new doctor dr magnus in the village he came at once and i showed him up to your room he sent mrs oram out leaving only homopoola and myself there except yourself well sandbagged explained the man nonchalantly dr magnus who is some kind of dago is evidently one of the gang sir lionel cried smith where does the passage lead to beyond that doorway god knows was the answer which dashed my last hope to the ground i have no more idea than yourself perhaps he ceased speaking a sound had interrupted him which in those grim surroundings lighted by the solitary lantern translated my thoughts magically to ancient rome to the rome of tigellinus to the dungeons of nero circus echoing eerily along the secret passages it came the roaring and snarling of the lioness and the leopards Nayland Smith clasped his hand to his brow and stared at me almost frenziedly then. "'God guard her,' he whispered. "'Either their plans, whenever they got them, are inaccurate, or in their panic they must have mistaken the way.' Wild cries were now mingling with the snarling of the beasts. "'They have blundered into the old crypt!' How we got out of the secret labyrinth of Greywater Park into the grounds, and around the angle of the west wing to the ivy-grown pointed door, where once the chapel had been i do not know light seemed to spring up about me and half-clad servants to appear out of the void temporarily i was insane sir lionel barton was behaving like a madman too and like a madman he tore at the ancient bolts and precipitated himself into the stone-paved cloister barred with the moon-cast shadows of the norman pillars from behind the iron bars of the home of the leopards came now a fearsome growling and scuffling Smith held the light with a steady hand whilst Kennedy forced the heavy bolts of the crypt door. In leapt the fearless baronet among his savage pets, and in the ray of light from the electric lamp I saw that which turned me sick with horror. Prone beside a yawning gap in the floor lay Homopulo, his throat torn indescribably, and his white shirt front smothered in blood. A black leopard, having its forepaws upon the dead man's breast, turned blazing eyes upon us a second crouched beside him heaped up in a corner of the place amongst the straw and litter of the lair lay the burmese dacoit 
his sinewy fingers embedded in the throat of the third and largest leopard which was dead whilst the creature's gleaming fangs were buried in the tattered flesh of the man's shoulder upon the straw beside the two her slim bare arms outstretched and her head pillowed upon them so that her rippling hair completely concealed her face lake garamina in a trice barton leapt upon the great beast standing over homopulo had him by the back of the neck and held him in his powerful hands whining with fear and helpless as a rat in the grip of a terrier the second leper fled into the inner lair so much i visualized in a flash then all faded and i knelt alone beside her whose life was my life in a world grown suddenly empty and still through long hours of agony i lived hours contained within the span of seconds and the beloved head resting against my shoulder whilst i searched for signs of life and dreaded to find ghastly wounds at first i could not credit the miracle i could not receive the wondrous truth karamina was quite uninjured and deep in drugged slumber the leopards thought her dead whispered smith brokenly and never touched her End of chapter 36